Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to start by introducing Dr. Lincoln Fishpool. Um, Lincoln uh, has just recently retired from uh, BirdLife International, where he worked for about 20 years, and uh, he was leading the development of the Important Bird Areas Programme, uh, firstly in Africa and then globally, um, and which has become gradually uh, more focused on, uh, potentially on wider, uh, through the Key Biodiversity Areas Programme. Um, he had previously worked uh, for some considerable time um, overseas, and, and I believe it was during his time in the Ivory Coast um, where he became particularly interested in the um, that uh, charismatic family of um, African birds, the green bulls. Um, and uh, so he's published several papers on green bulls. He also contributed articles to, I think, the first couple of um, bulletins of the African Bird Club when he started way back in the uh, in 1994. Um, and he also wrote the accounts for green bulls in the um, for African green bulls in the handbook of the birds of the world. So uh, uh, clearly a uh, gentleman of, of uh, considerable knowledge, um, and one of the more um, mysterious um, species, perhaps, of um, African green bull is the Liberian green bull, um, and that is the um, going to be the subject of Lincoln Fishbull's presentation to you this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you. Morning, all. Well, my attractive assistant will upload yeah. the. the Ho talk. Hopefully, that's all you need. Um, I see. Yeah. There we go. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Um, I should start by saying <coughs> I'm actually giving this talk on really on behalf of Ben Phelan, who names appeared there, as it was he who um, organised and led the expedition on which I'm going to be reporting on this morning, and he has con uh, contrib contributed most of many of the photographs in, in what's, what's to follow. I have adapted a talk that he that he um, that he gave uh, to a different audience some time ago. Um, this expedition took place in over a month in February, uh, March 2013, so about four years ago now, with money from resources in the RSPB and from ABC, and with local logistic support from the uh, <coughs> Society of the Conservation of Nature in Liberia, the, the bird life partner in, in the country there. Um, I'm afraid there's a bit, of <coughs> a bit of background on this, though, to, to set the scene. Um, <coughs> What is the Liberian green bull and why was it lost? Well, it was described in 1985 by Wolf Gatter, who collected the, uh, the unique type that's known uh, in 1984. Um, it was, <coughs> on basic, once collected in the hand, it was clear that it was a, a green bull um, pertaining to the genus Philostrephus. Um, but there are <coughs> a couple of reasons why he thought it was sufficiently different to describe it as distinct. One of the ones, one of those is, is obvious there, those spots on the wings. Um, of, the, <clears throat> of the 18 or so other members of the genus, none of them have spots on the wings. It may be a damn sight easy to identify if they did, but <clears throat> this is unique in, in the group in having those spots. Coupled to that, um, it also showed an, a behavior which um, other, is a, he thought unique in that uh, on a couple, at least two occasions, he saw individuals raising and trembling their wings as though they were using them to flush insect prey by, by, the, by those spots. Um, <coughs> Philostrophus green bulls um, often flick their wings, but this was something much more um, pr um, ostentatious or conspicuous than that. Uh, and he, um, the, the comparison he made was more with the blue-headed uh, crested flycatcher, Trochocircus nitens, which occurs in the region. <clears throat> so on the basis of those two things, he, he, he felt motivated to describe it as a species. He saw the bird on nine occasions between October and December 1981, against, again in uh, January 80, February 83, and then collected this type in Fe um, January 84. Seen on nine occasions. On two occasions, he saw two birds together, and on the, the, the greatest distance between sightings was about two kilometers. I'm sorry that there's a lot of detail there, but it's actually quite relevant to what comes later, so um, that's the reason for my laboring the point. <coughs> this is the uh, unique type, which sits in uh, the museum in, in, in um, Balm. 
Uh, its condition, as you can see, is not great. That's a consequence of, A, the shot that was used to, to kill it, but also the fact that it was, wasn't uh, collected until the morning after it was shot. So it spent overnight in the forest, and the ants got to it. Um, but you can see there um, if I can... the, the spots on the wings that um, gave it its other name, Spot Wing Green Ball. Now, um, he, as I said, uh, considered it was a, a, a good species, but in, his, in, that type, in that paper, he could also consider the, the issue of whether it was an aberrant form of something else or whether it was a hybrid form of two other somethings. Um, but he dismissed both of those and, and um, considered it was worthy of, of description. Um, but if it was uh, something else, what would, what, uh, if it was an aberrant form of something, well, this is the most likely candidate, the Icterine green bull, which is common and widespread um, throughout much of uh, the forests of uh, most of Central Africa. And indeed, it occurs not only in the same area where he collected the, the type of specimen of spotwing green bull, Liberian green bull, but also in the same bird parties. So they're actually co-occurring uh, on, a, on a local scale. And if it was... Um, a hybrid, then the chances, what well, this would almost certainly be one parent, and it was suggested that maybe spotted green bull uh, could be the, the, the other parent. Uh, this contingency, I, I think, was always thought remote. The only reason it was chosen is because A, it's a green bull, and B, it's got some spots on the wings, but those spots are differently distributed, and it's got white outer tail feathers here. And uh, also, it's in a different genus. It's not closely related to the Philostrepus green bulls. And intergeneric hybrids are not known in, uh, in, in green bulls. So that was a bit of a long shot. And even, an even longer shot is Nicata, which at that time was also thought to be a green bull, is now in a separate family. <coughs> um, so ostensibly, there's a, uh, we have a, a species described from this one, with this one, this one specimen. Uh, and why this matters, this matters not just for science or for, for listers, but also it means, means important for conservation purposes. This is, it was considered up until the end of last year to be critically endangered by IUCN, by bird life. And it was a single site endemic. So should, how much uh, conservation focus should be devoted onto, onto uh, securing the, the habitat from, from which it was, was, uh, was known, which is currently unprotected. Um, since this time, it has been, as time has gone on, and um, uh, uncertainty over its existence um, has, has grown, to which I have to confess I contributed rather, um, it's now been revised downward as to being data deficient. But that doesn't change the, the, um, the validity of what I've just said. And where does it occur? Well, <clears throat> we're in eastern Liberia in um, West Africa here, and that patch there is the, the forest area in where this, this, the, the, the sightings were made and the specimen was collected. And then homing in a bit, um, this is Sapo National Park in Liberia. This is Thai in neighboring Ivory Coast. Here's Mount Nimba up here in, uh, on the border of the Ivory Coast in Guinea, and we're in this bit here. And X marks the spot of where the um, where the type was collected, uh, <coughs> northwest of town of Zwedru there. And this <coughs> this is one of the reasons why doubts or, or uncertainty crept in, because it's only ever been found at this one area, this very small area. And um, Okay, there are other rare species described in the last in the last fifty years from West Africa, only known from a few uh, one place or one or two places initially. But subsequent field work has shown them to be more widely distributed than, than first thought. So, for example, Nimba flycatcher, um, Gola malimbi, um, yellow-footed honey guide are, are all described in the last fifty years or so from West Africa, but, um, but all have been found as as a consequence of. Um, to be more widespread than initially believed. Now, obviously, the, um, the civil wars in, in Liberia meant that uh, field work in that country has not been really been possible for, um, uh, for a long period. So you could argue, well, that it's, it's a lack of survey in the, in the core areas, which is one of the reasons why it's not been found. 
But the other thing about this is that Philostrephus green balls aren't generally um, in, um, difficult to find where they occur. They are, they're actually generally common, even, in, even if they have fairly limited distribution. So the one, the one in, Cameroon, in the Cameroon Highlands, for example, if you go to forests there, it's not that difficult to find. And this bird apparently draws attention to itself by trembling its wings, displaying its spots. So it ought to be a too difficult survey target for, for people to, to see if it, if it was occurring there. And coming in even further now, um, we're in here. And this patch of forest is not unique. It's only, we're only 200 meters altitude here. It's contiguous with other bits of forest, or at least it was until recently. And there's no reason, there's no floristic or geological uh, reason to think that this is, um, is any different significantly from anything else around it. So why is, is, is the bird so limited in, in its uh, distribution? Well, that's the answer we try and, we uh, sought to uh, try and answer. And so Ben and I arrived in uh, Monrovia in February 2013. Uh, we're here in the compound of the uh, conservation uh, SCNL, the, the, the life partner. And they had been able, with the funds that we had been able to raise for the project, bought a reconditioned uh, four-wheel drive vehicle fr from the EU, from, e from a closed EU project there. I think it was a certain amount of rate, mates rates got, went on here between the um, the head of the SCNL and um, the vendor. But this is us uh, about to set out. Um, ben in, in action pose there. And this is us a couple of hours later. Because, <laughs> uh, the reconditioning wasn't quite adequate enough. Um, um, but um, a phone call had been made, uh, was made, and a couple of hours later we were back on the road again for, with a different vehicle. Um, this is the team. Um, so going from left to right here, um, this is Flomo Moloba, who um, with uh, the head of uh, SCNL, uh, Michael Garbo, had um, made a trip uh, four years pre previously, which kind of foreshadowed our, our, um, our, our, uh, our expedition to the area um, to look to do some to look, to look for the bird um, themselves. They weren't able to spend very long in the field, and they were unsuccessful. But they, uh, they, they, they set it up for us nicely because they discovered where we needed to go, and they made contacts with, with local people whom had worked with, with the original describer uh, back in the 80s. And then we have um, Trocon and Emmanuel here are from the Forest Department, Forest Development Authority, and the, the BirdLife Partner, respectively. And they were, we were helping train them in... in um, um, forest ornithology or as we were going to uh, help to as a, another contrib contribution to a legacy of the project. Um, the guy in the middle uh, was key to the to the um, to the success of the project or the expedition in the sense that um, he was um, well, not exactly a poacher turned gamekeeper more a hunter turned uh, guide for a month or so and <clears throat> um, his local knowledge his savoir faire and, and local skills were, were key to, to, to us achieving what we set out to do. And the aims of the, uh, the exercise were obviously to find the green bull, and if we could find it, take sound recordings of it, take photographs of it, get a, and make an assessment of its, um, its distribution, take some genetic samples from it if we were lucky enough to get one in a net, build, build some local capacity, as I say, Improved knowledge of the important bird and biodiversity area, which was originally described for this green ball back in the late 90s when field work was impossible. And, um, so this was trying to seek the ground truth it and then get, get better definition of, of where the area should be. Understand what the threats to the, uh, the forest and, and therefore the biodiversity within them were. And also to catch some local ictorine green balls to take some genetic samples, blood samples from them for subsequent analysis. And I'll come back to that later. Um, so this is a bit of a minor montage of uh, you know the vagaries of travel out there, um, interesting bridges, um, the usual um, interest provoked with, with local people, uh, curiosity and lots of excitement. Um, um, the local muscle power was was clearly uh, was it was invaluable to our to our success, but not uh, not exactly inexhaustible as you can see. Um, 
I'll draw your attention to the, um, the locally uh, appropriate backpack there, which was knocked up by Dwe in about half an hour from local materials. Uh, just the skill, the knowledge of which 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 bits, bits of lions and, and wood to use and uh, how to put it all together um, was, was was really astonishing. Um, the main threats we, we <coughs> to the forest were unquestionably the main one is unquestionably commercial logging. Um, it's not happening now, but um, the local people want it to happen, and. Um, Shortly before our, the, the area was under a logging concession, shortly before we arrived, there were um, some, uh, those, those concessions were revoked during our, or immediately before we arrived because of the um, suggestion of malpractice in awarding of those contracts. And I confess I'm not sure what the latest uh, about um, news is about how that's, that's, that's changed. But this area is, is currently unprotected and, uh, and, and at least was under a, a logging concession. The other, one, the other threats that I report there, there had been plantations of exotic species such as teak and gamelina in, um, um, trialed in the 80s, which was what Wolf Gatter, the describer, was working on. He was a forest, he's a forester by training. <coughs> um, the, the charcoal burning and the small scale agriculture was there, but it, it, wasn't, um, it wasn't too significant. I was actually pleasantly surprised, if that's the word to use, by how low the human population density was in these in many of these areas, there's a <clears throat> the, tr the relatively few tracks through through the through the forest. Where there are there are some villages, and around those villages there is clearance from up to two to three hundred meters in to <clears throat> from those um, from the road. But you get beyond that, and you get into increasingly good quality forest. Um, human population is of course increasing, so this will expand. But at the moment, at least. Um, it's not too bad, not too serious. Um, the hunting of large birds and mammals, though, is... Um, I want to talk about this briefly. Uh, this is not a terribly good slide, um, but what it shows is um, it's, a, it's a shotgun cartridge. We noticed that sometimes we found shotgun cartridges discarded on the floor, and sometimes they were stuck on the top of sticks about yay high, about knee high. And sometimes those, those cartridges were entire, and sometimes they had slits in them and sides pulled up. On inquiry, we found that um, if they were on the floor, that represented a miss by the, by the gut person pulling the trigger. If they were stuck on a stick, that indicated a hit. And so some sort of um, way of uh, reminding themselves where they had success or telling their, their, their fellow hunters where, where they had success. And more than that, if they were entire, that meant they shot a, a terrestrial mammal there, such as a diker. If they had one side pulled up, it meant they it, it, they'd shot an arboreal mammal, such as a, a monkey. Two wings out like that meant that it was probably a large hornbill or, or another big bird. <coughs> ben immediately got excited and wondered whether one could do some, some sociological analysis of the levels of hunting there, but we never pursued that. These areas, the, <clears throat> the trails through the, um, the forest were all, were, which the hunters used were allocated by family or, 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 with, or within the tribe and they were carefully controlled who could hunt where. So they knew each other and um, this was passing on information from one to another. Um, as for trying to find the, the green bull, because the original observations, many of them had been made in mixed species flocks, we thought focusing on these was going to be the, the um, the, the best way to go, uh, and we try and connect with as many of those as we could. We used playback, both of the call of victory in Green Bull and trialing uh, Shining Drongo or Red-Chested Owlet calls to try and provoke, active, bring in uh, bird party activity to where we had put up some mist nets uh, to catch them, ca to catch Liberians if they were there and, and, uh, and Victorines as well. I have to say the, the drongo and the owlet work, uh, didn't really work at all, but the Eterine playback um, uh, worked well for them. Right, um, some results here. Um, we, we connected with about over 50 mixed species flocks covering about 92 species, but there were no Liberian green bulls in them. Um, there were plenty of olive sunbirds in them, however. Um, and on the netting, we got 23 species, uh, 90, 90, 97 birds netted, including this, this, this page three stunner of a, a red-fronted ant pecker. 
Um, and here, here's a map of um, where we went. So Zwedru is down off to the bottom right here. Um, this is the forestry station where Gata was based. X marks the spot again where the, the, the type locality of the, where the bird was collected. And the yellow trails are where we walked, or, or in, some, in some places drove along this main drag. And the red, the red squares are where we caught extreme green bulls and were able to take some blood samples for DNA analysis. Also got white-throated green bull, another fellow Strephus green bull, on one occasion, and we uh, took some DNA from an, an Alifi as for a, an outgroup comparison purposes. So within the, over the course of a month, uh, we covered the area reasonably extensively. Right, some more gratuitous bird pictures. Um, Black dwarf hornbill was a, we saw quite a few of. Plenty of blue-throated rollers. White tailed leafy I've just mentioned. And this, although it's a, a, a band, not a good, good quality photograph, I don't apologize for showing it, but I never thought to see outside um, the protected area. This is um, a white-breasted guinea fowl, um, which uh, we saw on three separate occasions in three different places. So that there's a, a reasonable population of them still there, which is gratifying. Dre, the hunter, knew the call, their contact call. They can imitate them, draw them in, and shoot several at once. But I think at the moment there's enough other large stuff that they're, 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 these aren't the, focus, the main focus of their, their interest. So over 180 bird species were recorded in the course of this work. Um, 11 of them were a global conservation concern, which means that they were either um, endangered, vulnerable, or uh, near threatened, data deficient on the, on, the, on the red list. In addition to the birds, there was evidence of chimpanzees, um, pygmy hippo still being there, um, Gentix dica, dica, zebra dica, so, uh, plus um, western red colobus. So there's, there's a good range of mammals still there, and we saw plenty of large hornbills. So although despite the depredations of Douai and his, his, his friends, there are, is still a, a good population of a large, of much large biodiversity in, the, in, the, in these forests. Red-chested owlet, I mentioned. Um, this is one we you draw, drew in using its call. Forest robin. Just a breasted negro finch, negrita. And a couple of kingfishers, white-bellied, African dwarf. And picturing green bulls we caught. This is a picture of uh, Ben <coughs> taking a blood sample from the vein, the brachial vein of, a, of one individual. A very small amount of blood is taken, um, less than 200 millilitres, uh, and then taken under, uh, well, far as possible aseptic conditions. It's, it's the, 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 bird, the, the, bird, the area is sterilised afterwards and the bird is kept for a while before to ensure it's okay before it's being released. Um, I can't explain the gunshot wound in his stomach here. This is, I never got to the bottom of that. So. The, <coughs> Um, these blood samples were then sent to um, um, Martin Collinson's team in the University of Aberdeen and to Martin Packert's uh, lab in Dresden, Senckenberg Muse Museum. And they <coughs> have been comparing the results of that with samples taken from the unique type specimen that I showed you earlier. Some toe samples have been taken and uh, some information sort of hot off the press, <coughs> um, which is this, these results aren't yet published, but they've been submitted to Journal of Ornithology. Um, there's a limitation on the quality of the, the amount of data they were able to resolve from the degraded uh, DNA in the, in the specimen, uh, uh, the museum specimen. But um, what they are showing is that the Liberian green bull sits fairly and squarely in, within Icterine green bull's um, DNA. So the, the inference from this is that there's a, there's a strong, very strong possibility that Liberian green bull does in fact turn out to be an odd uh, Icterine. We, it, the, the, the possibility of it being a, a hybrid has been eliminated as a result of this work. And as it says there, the range of interest specific to gen <coughs> uh, 
um, genetic variation observed in nectarine green ball effectively easily encompasses the, the, uh, the, the Liberian green ball. However, there's a couple of, because of the, the, small, <coughs> the, the, the poor quality of the Liberian sample, it means that in theory there are a couple of other possibilities exist. One is that Liberians and nectarines are separate species but have only diverged but relatively recently, uh, very recently, such that the, they're still sharing a lot of their DNA or that they've separated a long time ago but are still interbreeding, in effect. But both of these contingencies are thought to be extremely remote. But they can't actually be formally ruled out until, unless and until um, more, uh, more, another population of Liberian green bull is, re is rediscovered. Um, how am I doing for time? I'm OK. OK, then, well, OK, then in that case, how to explain the spots on the wings and this behavior, how do, how do we reconcile that with the fact that this bird might be a nectarine green bull or is a nectarine green bull? Well, <coughs> excuse me, this is a, a picture of a wing of a, a carrion crow um, provided to, to us by Heinemann Grau of the Natural History Museum in Tring, who's a specialist on um, plumage aberrations. This is a, a juvenile bird which um, is known or thought to have uh, suffered um, a dietary deficiency during its de developmental phase as a juvenile. When a juvenile point being that they're growing feathers all together, they're not molting them uh, sequentially. Um, and the supposition is that maybe a clutch of uh, nectarine green bulls had some sort of dietary deficiency that um, caught, provoked those spots. We can't, that can't be proven. Nor can the possible an explanation of the, the trembling wings. But if they are juveniles, could those trembling wings actually be begging behavior shown by um, Liberian green bulls to its parents, which we know Icterine green bulls occurred in the same flock. So maybe the, 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 two, the two things are connected. Um, what this doesn't well, the fact that they are the, 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 um, the greatest distance between the, these records was about two kilometers isn't um, too much isn't a constraint because uh, it's thought that it's known from work in Gabon that um, from ringing studies that they birds will particularly juvenile birds will wander from up, uh, at least up at least a kilometer from where they were ringed um, but more hard to explain if that is the is if that is an explanation, is the time interval between them from 1981 to 1984. That's three years. So is, it, is this multiple clutches, or is it a question of um, some arrested molt uh, in, in, if, because of the deficiency? That's all speculation. We don't know. We don't know. Um, I just <clears throat> want to conclude by saying, um, although it's always nice to have one's prejudices confirmed, um, um, my belief that, uh, from early on was that this was an extreme green bull seemed to be right. On the other hand, I came away from that trip rather, well, the results are, are regretful in one sense in, in that um, it's, going to, it's going to mean one, one additional reason for the potential conservation prospects of those forests are, are lost, are not going to be there. Um, and that is a pity because um, there is Given the relatively low, low population density, the fact that I didn't mention earlier that I should have done that, that it has been proposed as a conservation area um, some years ago, but without any action being taken on it, uh, means that in, in theory there ought to be scope for conserving these, fo uh, these forests, notwithstanding the local population's desire for logging and therefore uh, in local income generation, if they can be persuaded that they can um, some income can be generated from, from the conservation efforts as well. Right, thank you, that's me done. Thanks, Fish. Um, we've got time for uh, a few questions, if anyone's got questions. Um, I think there are microphones. Hopefully, does that work? Yeah, press on the button on the side. Yeah, it does. It um, appears to come on. 
We'll try. Um, has anyone got a question? There we go. See if, you, see if you can try the mic. That's it. It's working. It's working. Yeah. You just have to yeah. be quite close. Um, yeah. Great talk. Um, when Wolf Gatter found those birds in that range of about two kilometers, I presume he was also looking elsewhere, say four or five kilometers, 10 kilometers away as well. So if they'd been in those other areas, he would have seen them. I just wanted to check that he was actually looking wider yes. than just that two kilometers. Yes, that's right. He was working over a relatively large patch. He spent um, over 500 days in the field and saw these birds on nine of those days and covered a wider area than, than I'm describing, yeah. Uh, was the edge of the pale spot on the uh, the wings sharply de delineated, or was it blurred in like those carrion crows? I seem to remember it was sharp edged. Um, well, it's kind of, it's kind of hard to tell, isn't it? Uh, the condition of of the bird means that not many feathers are available for study. But yes, it, it looks like up, a clean line, which it's a reasonably clean line, yeah, which yeah. suggests that it wouldn't be a developmental uh, um, dietary change. I would think. Yes, you're potentially right. I have shown that in the photographs of this <coughs> to to Hein in, in the museum there, and he thought. It, it, it could be attributable to that. He wasn't ruling it out for that reason. Uh, and another point, um, I'm not sure which lab it was, but one lab suggested, for example, that Isabella Aureole and White Lord Aureole in the Philippines were not distinguishable by DNA, uh, and yet they very clearly are completely different species, sympatric species. So some of these DNA results are not necessarily to be taken at face value. Yeah. Uh, point taken, yep. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Thank uh, thanks. This is just a comment. I think this is for me. I think you will be still at the Right. Yes, certainly the community there wanted those concessions. There was a committee that had been set up to, um, that's right, for forest management, which effectively was uh, seeking to bring in the commercial loggers. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, there's one more. Right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Lincoln. Um, Really interesting talk to start us off. Um, perhaps we can just uh, for our. Um, <laughs>